Hi, and welcome. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the virtual international component of um, today's hybrid 2020 Brooklyn Book Festival. I'm Andy Tepper. I'm co-chair of the International Committee, and it's a true pleasure to moderate today's conversation with Andrea, uh, Andrea Bayani, Miriam J.A. Chansey, and Anouk um, Arud Pergasam. Memory is our panel's theme, or at least the jumping off point uh, to discuss three astonishing new novels by these authors. A reminder that the books are for sale at the link below. And since we have just under an hour, let me quickly give uh, very short abbreviated bios and then we'll begin our conversation, followed I hope by um, short readings and then questions from the chat, uh, chat function. So, um, I, yeah, I hope we can uh, really begin to delve into these books and get a sense of uh, a sense of them in this little time that we have. Andrea Bayani is an Italian novelist, journalist, and poet, and author of "If You Kept a Record of Sins," published by Archipelago Books uh, and translated by Elizabeth Harris. And Miriam J. A. Chancy is a Canadian Haitian American writer and author of What Storm, What Thunder, which is coming out this week, I believe Tuesday from Tin House. And Anouk Arud Pergasam was born and raised in Colombo, Sri Lanka and is the author of The Story of, of a Brief Marriage and his new novel, A Passage North, which is shortlisted for this year's Booker Prize, which is to be announced uh, November 3rd. So good luck, Anouk. And, um, so welcome the three of you, and I uh, wish we could meet in person, but um, tell me where you are now and, and uh, where you've spent this year. So let's start. <laughs> and we're so, gonna find out an interesting juxtaposition about where- Yeah, yeah, are. I started with the alphabet, so I thought <laughs> maybe- <laughs> Yeah, please jump maybe. in. Maybe, yeah, at, uh, like at school. Uh, so now I'm in Houston, Texas, uh, uh, where I'm writing a residence. Uh, and, uh, oh, where I spent a year is a very complicated answer because I was going back and forth uh, from Italy uh, to the US. So I was uh, basically on a never ending book tour in Italy. Uh, going back and forth uh, in, a, in a bus and then being on stage every night uh, saying more or less uh, the same things, uh, trying to pretend it to be different. Uh, and and I'm back in Houston. I'm and from, that's from a, a different book. Is that from yeah, a, from a different book? book. The, a, a book that came, just came out in Italy, whose title is a Liberally Casa, the Book of Holmes. Is it a, a novel? Yeah, it's a novel. Okay, it's great. Novel. Yeah. Um, and Miriam? Uh, yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you for everyone to, for being here and Anderson Welcome for here. being our host and uh, also for to, thank you to the Brooklyn Book Festival. Um, I'm right now in greater Los Angeles and I have been here for all of last year, <laughs> unable to go anywhere else yeah. except locally. So. And Anouk? Um, and hi, everyone. Um, I am actually, funnily enough, uh, in uh, in Italy, in a close to a town called Umbertide, uh, where I am for a few weeks for residency. I've been living in uh, Paris this year, uh, but I'm from but I'm from Sri Lanka, and uh, and I've been living kind of between Sri Lanka and India for the last few years. And of course, I'm very jealous that he's in Italy. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> so, I want to begin with a question. I'll open it up to the three of you, and and. Um, and jump in as you like. But um, each of your books deal with the weight of memory in different ways and from different perspectives. Andrea, your novel is about, a, I mean, is a, the story of a grown son who addresses directly the spirit of his um, re recently deceased mother. Uh, and he's getting over in his mind, his memories of her abandonment of him as a child. As he says, you started leaving when I was young. Anouk, your central character, uh, Christian, is, uh, is, is balancing an int intense personal and social memories of a love affair and also the history of Sri Lanka's decades-long civil war. And Miriam, your novel uses a choral of voices to revisit and reconsider the devastation of Haiti's earthquake in January 12th of 2010. 
So tell me, each of you, how did you want to approach memory in its various forms and facets? And how much of a burden or weight does it represent to your main characters? I'd be happy to start. Um, if we want to go in backwards order this time, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I think for me, I've been thinking about this a lot, actually, um, because I've been getting a que a questions about time in the novel. Yeah. And I reflected upon the idea that this actually does have a lot to do with memory. And I think this, the challenge for me, because I have, uh, as you said, a chorus of voices, 10 voices telling the story of the earthquake, their individual response to the earthquake before, during, and after. And I think that whether you were, you know, you experienced the earthquake firsthand or you were outside as I was when the earthquake occurred. And I'm originally from Paulo Prince, Haiti. So it was an intimate experience, even for, for someone like me on the outside. There, there is a sense of fractured time. There is a sense in which all time is suspended while the events are ongoing. And also during the period where you don't know where your uh, familiars are. You don't know if people in your family are dead or alive, your colleagues and so forth. And you know, for people in my immediate family, this went on for about three weeks after the earthquake. And for other people whom I helped to locate, it took several months to locate individuals. And often that meant that on the way to finding individuals, one came across a lot of uh, contacts who were dead and then having to report back. So there's a lot of lag time yeah. in the reporting back in you know, trying to reconceptualize what happened. And so part of the work of a narrative of the novel was to in fact do that kind of reconstructive work on behalf of the characters and to translate that effectively to the readers in such a way that they could experience that fracturing of time and also the way in which trauma affects the way that individuals remember time. And so the memories are not all the same in the same way that the experience of the earthquake cannot be the same. Yeah, and you use characters at different points in time. The, the narrators are each at a different point of time reflecting. Um, yes, yes and no, in the sense that there, there's one character who bookends the novel, a market woman in her right. 70s, and she begins the narrative in 2014, right. although the novel actually ends with her voice in 2012. But in between, most of the voices are in 2010. Um, but they are at various times in that first year, either right before the earthquake or during it, like the day of the earthquake or several weeks to several months after the earthquake. Right. Uh, but how they experience time, especially psychologically, is very different from one person to the other, especially uh, if they were affected in a way that is unchangeable. For example, one woman loses all of her children. And so her attempt to reconceptualize being in time is almost impossible. And so she's written from that perspective. And Andrea and Anouk, you, your characters are looking back a little bit further in the, in the past. Um, yeah, um, it's interesting because in a way, uh, my novel like Miriam's is um, is written in response to a, is, is written in response to a kind of historical catastrophe. It um, the catastrophe being the the end of the thirty year civil war in Sri Lanka in two thousand eight two thousand nine, which was a period in which um, between forty and one hundred fifty thousand people from my community were killed, um, um, and and I also was not present during this time during the time in which this this act of genocide occurred. Um, and the book takes place maybe uh, six, seven years after um, and consists basically of a, of a young Tamil man uh, traveling from the south of Sri Lanka to, to the north uh, to ground zero uh, for the funeral and possible, uh, the funeral of a woman who's possibly committed suicide. Um, and like Miriam's, this book is also really uh, very much about time. <laughs> and um, I think, uh, in a way for me, yeah, the character is um, long, sec I mean, the, the character doesn't act in this book. He receives a message in the first section informing him of the death. The middle section is maybe 150 pages of him on a train, uh, basically remembering things about the, the woman who's, who's, who's passed away, um, remembering things about a, about a relationship uh, he'd been in in the past, um, 
uh, remembering things about the country, about things he's seen as he as he looks out the the train window. And the last part is just him at the funeral of this woman um, in a house first, and then at the funeral part. He doesn't really act. He really just observes, and the and the and the novel kind of moves uh, constantly between uh, memory and and perception. And it's interesting, but for me, the the reason that I guess. Uh, remembered experiences are so much a part of this novel is because um, for this character at least um, I mean the way we experience memory is uh, is often as something that we don't have agency over the remembered event uh, is is stuck in time in a way and I mean people talk often about the way in which memory is constructed or influenced by the present but the experience of a memory is the experience of something that one has no agency over. And I think for me, that has to do with also my situation um, uh, of being outside of this time, of being outside of this period of great suffering and what it means to also watch violence um, unfolding from afar and the, and the vivid sense of being unable to act, to unable to, to do anything. And so the whole, the whole novel, I mean, for me, yeah, for me, I think dealing with memory in this book was also dealing with what it means to to lack agency with respect to with respect to experience. Yeah, and Andrea, tell us about the time period, the historical period you're dealing with. You, oh, it's, it's in uh, the '90s, but you're remembering a childhood of the '70s in Italy, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it was very interesting what uh, Miriam and Anouk said, and. Uh, the what the next said between the difference of being at the edge between memory and perception that I guess it's something that is uh is a, is a nuance we could talk about for hours but uh, <laughs> uh but but said phrase that way is very is very powerful um so um yeah the book uh, if you kept the record of scenes is basically the story of a of a grown up that uh, uh just got the news that uh his mom just passed away and uh, they are from Italy, but she moved to uh, Bucharest, to Bucharest, to Romania, just to, she's a manager in, in enterprises and uh, she has a company, she has a firm. And, uh, and so basically um, the idea is to, to have two these memories or two these, uh, um, two different ideas of someone, one stuck in the past, that is uh, the, the magic mom uh, and someone that died and uh, uh, left, abandoned the little one uh, uh, in Italy. But so uh, I would say that there are two things uh, um, uh, connected to time. The first thing is uh, uh, the experience. Uh, we always think that time is just one, not memory, but time is just one that we are going the same speed uh, in the uh, all over the world we are experiencing the same time and now the pandemic is also uh, even more misunderstanding about that as if we were just flying the same speed uh, whereas for instance going from Italy to the former um, a communist bloc, a communist uh, universe was also experiences two different kinds of two different ways of perceiving time of uh, dealing with the present and future, a capitalistic one and uh, the communist one, the socialist one. So the idea of time that can be built, can be planned in the communist world and the idea of time that is just to be burnt in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the capitalistic world. So one thing is uh, perceiving, having the sense that time is not just one thing, the same time, even if we are living the same uh, moment. Um, and then uh, about memory, I have to say two things. One, one thing is connected to school, meaning that uh, uh, when we learn verbs at school, uh, they, there's this uh, idea that uh, implied more or less that uh, uh, past is something solid, then there's present and then there's future. And so that uh, you can uh, um, you can pack your past and then it's there. Uh, whereas uh, our everyday experience show, shows that uh, time is just kind of a, a kind of a wind flowing uh, and blowing. Uh, and so uh, as soon as you uh, smell Proust, Totas, that that as soon as you smell, as soon as you taste something, past can come and 
past can change. So memory is exactly that. Memory is the idea that time and so what you lived can change. It's not that uh, if you live that, uh, if this little boy then grown up who goes, flies to Bucharest, uh, experience one thing. So what you experience is safe. It's not safe because it's a, a time is always also past, has to be negotiated and is always negotiated. That's why also we have to be very politically very careful and be very watching what and in which way uh, past can be manipulated or can be told to the future uh, generation. And the third thing that is uh, connected to writing, uh, that's very interesting, I'll be um, uh, quick, it's about my son. I have a two-year-old boy. And, uh, and you know that the first three years or, of your life are supposed to be the years in which you don't remember anything of what you experience. But at the same time, they are supposed to, to be the years in which you become what you are. No, uh, and so sometimes looking at my son, playing with him and the, him being so aware, I always ask him, how is it possible that you will not remember what we are living now? No, and, and memory is that. So is experiencing something that is so strong that uh, uh, builds your personality and at the same time not remembering anything about that. So basically our personality is, uh, is built in a moment of life we don't have memory about, and we will deal about that. We will wonder, we ask ourselves what we are, trying to remember, trying to say lots of things about memory, but the only important things can't be remembered. I think that writing, or at least for me, is the only it is the only tool to get to the first three years of your life. I think that when we write as writers, in a way that is kind of magical, I don't know what, I don't know why, we go and we can deal with the memory we forgot and that uh, build the, the people we are. Mm. If anyone wants to jump in, please do. But I'll, I'll quickly go on to another question. And, and um, you, you talked about Miriam, uh, memory and perception. What I'm also interested in um, talking about is the tension between memory and forgetting um, for both your characters and indeed their countries. Um, Miriam, you, of course, the question of Haiti, but you also deal with Rwanda in your, in your book, this idea of, of remembering and forgetting or um, the genocide there. And then of course, in Romania, there's the um, Cuchescu Palace and Museum and your characters, Andrea, talk about um, the crimes of the dictatorship of, of Romania. And of course, Sri Lanka too, it's a question of what is remembered and what, what people choose to forget. Well, <laughs> it feels like there's a lot to respond to and that's also a big question. Um, and I'm gonna try to be succinct. Um, I don't entirely agree, I think, with, with um, what Andrea was saying before about our forgetting. Um, so for, for me, for example, my, my very strong memories of Port-au-Prince really begin in very early childhood. So a little bit less than two and on. Um, which really solidified my sense of identity and culture in a way that I think assists my writing. So in that, in that sense, I would agree. Um, but I think, and this is something I had to really think through for on behalf of my characters, but there's also a very class-based idea of what memory consists of and what time consists of. So I agree, for example, that there's a, maybe a difference in time in terms of you know, uh, the Eastern Bloc countries, communist countries and capitalist countries, et cetera. But in a place like Haiti or many places of the third world, uh, entre guillemets, or the Caribbean, um, there is still that sense of lag, there is that sense of slowness, there is that sense that time is taking place in a different dimension, and it's also a spiritual dimension. So, for example, with the novel that I'm, you know, what I created, you know, I had to deal with thinking through the fact that many people, I started writing in 2013, by 2013, many people outside of Haiti had forgotten 
that 250,000 people died. You know, now the death toll has been brought up to about 300,000 300, people who died in 45 seconds. Uh, you know, the, those who were homeless, 1.5 to 1.7 million. And we just had an earthquake in August uh, where 2,200 people died and an equal number of people were left without shelter. Uh, and in the scheme of things, when we think about earthquakes in the contemporary time, the last earthquake is considered catastrophic. So with one thinks back to 2010 and that number of dead, it's actually the second highest death toll since the 1500s in China. So the fact that people forgot this and that couldn't remember what happened, especially in North America, very close to them and saw no relationship between fault lines running through uh, underneath Haiti with fault lines that run through uh, Florida, the panhandle of Florida, right up the, the Eastern seaboard of the United States, I think for me was remarkable. I was then living in Cincinnati, which has 300,000 people. And most individuals that I knew in that city couldn't imagine that city being wiped out in less than a minute, which is essentially what happened in terms of the numbers of people who disappeared. So my task was about working against that level of forgetfulness because the other point I'd like to make is that for people who were con intimately connected to Haiti, are still connected to Haiti, and went through the earthquake as well, uh, different sets of people, the sense of not being able to forget is also a kind of haunting, right? So that what people are going through still today, so when the earthquake in August 14th of this year occurred, I received many phone calls and I too went through an experience of recollecting what 2010 was like, 2010 forward. Because if you lost your entire family group in that earthquake, if you lost your colleagues, if you lost your friends, et cetera, if uh, as in my case, the place where you were baptized has disappeared and you know that you cannot bring your family members back to your home country to see the places where you went to school, where you know speaking about school and how that might organize a certain sense of, of the past and history, all of that is gone and yet, some of us remember it and some of us have to deal with the fact that we're the only people left to remember those who are gone and for whom there exists no roles, no quantification of their existence, no traces of having existed, not even, uh, or actually all that is left are mass graves. And that's the connection to Rwanda, which I've also spent some time in. And you know, coming face to face with the mass grave at the Genocide Museum, which is marked as containing 250,000 people, which I visited in 2013, and bones were still being brought into that mass grave. So it must contain many more uh, and than 200. One of the characters. Yeah, one of the characters works in Rwanda. So yeah. when you thought of this novel and you wanted to deal with the, the memory of this, this earthquake, you, did you start out knowing that you wanted to have a community of narrators? They wanted. It wouldn't yes. be a novel of one narrator. It had to be a collective. Yeah. It had to be a collective. And, and I guess just, my, just to round out the answer, just to my final point, and this is the point about class, is that I have many characters who are you know, very liminal in society. And so their understanding of time is not organized by school. They may not have ever gone to school. They may not have an organization of how time works that is like anybody else because they are considered to be out of time. They are considered to be unimportant. And the point for me in the novel was to make clear that everybody counts in this society and the most liminal characters like the market women are actually the people who run that society and keep it afloat and should be respected and should be consulted when uh, you know, ideas of reconstruction are brought forward and so forth and they are never consulted, but they you know, know the most character. about the culture. Right, Malu, she's, the market woman says, we watch, I listen. That's right, because yeah. we because in front of market and this is the world over, you know we you know whether it's Italy or the Caribbean, I'm sure Sri Lanka, everywhere, the marketplace are, is filled with people who are overlooked and in whom ev in front of whom everything is said and they know what is going on politically, economically, socially, and that's what what Malu reflects in the novel. Anouk, did you want to add something? Or, or I can also phrase a question. I'm interested in perspective. Um, Andrea, you, you write in the first person. And Miriam, you use a combination of first and third. And Anouk, yours is a third person. Do you want to tell us 
your choice and your perspective? Well, um, I think, yeah, it's true that I write in third person and um, it's difficult for me to explain why I, 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 um, uh, I think maybe I, I, I feel that because of the subjects I'm writing about and because of my relative subject position to other members of my community, uh, I, I worry that maybe writing in the first person would, um, I don't know, I'm, 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 would 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 give too much uh, importance to 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 the to the author subjectivity. It's false. It's not true. One doesn't need to write like that uh, in the first person. But there's this kind of a version that I have. But what I did want to um, talk about that was kind of uh, I guess going off uh, what Miriam was saying. Um, it's interesting because um, uh, I, I I have the I'm in the shameful position of um, of of having a of having a mother tongue and and not writing in it and writing in another language English, um, and and my book uh, and my work deals with with memory and things that um, things that in in the country that I'm from uh, uh, we are not allowed to to me to memorialize or to mourn uh, in public. Uh, it's it's illegal, and and. And so my work is yes, it's obviously also like uh, some attempt to 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 memorialize. But I yeah, it's this. I, I don't know if Miriam, you have uh, any thoughts on this, but um, or or you, Andrea. But um, I have this. Yeah, I also. I mean, I feel I feel uh, I feel two ways about it because um, uh, in some sense. Uh, it doesn't matter to me whether people in America or people English language, English, English reading, the English reading public remembers or learns about what happened or doesn't or doesn't learn about what happened. Um, in a way, um, what they remember and what they forget is is not really of relevance to me in my community. Um, and so uh, yeah, this is, I mean, I guess I, this is all I had to say that in like, in, uh, um, yeah, I don't know, it, I, I don't think of, yeah, I guess I don't think of my work as, as trying to, as trying to memorialize, um, and yet it is, and yet it is in some way about memory, and it is in some way a kind of uh, a personal gesture, and in fact, indeed, a personal gesture towards, towards remembering. Um, I wanna... uh, yeah. Can I ask you then how you decided to balance the, the different personal memories with the with the more social memories? I mean, his love affair is a is a big theme. He's he's just gotten an email from a lover from four he hasn't seen in four years. And so that's a big part. How how were you able to give weight to to the different aspects? Well, um the uh the, I mean, the, are they intertwined? Yeah, they are in a sense. I mean, actually, it's it's funny because uh, I I mean, I guess some readers have 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 wondered what the connection is between these memories of of a genocide and these these memories of 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 a, of a personal event that the narrator is very well aware is in 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 contrast trivial and 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 only personally relevant. Um, and I, I don't know if this has to do with memory per se, but um, but I didn't I didn't want to write this book. Uh, I mean, about I didn't want to write a book about a genocide. In fact, I had already written a book, right? And it was something that I was actually trying to get away from. In fact, I tried with this novel uh, specifically to write about things that were um, maybe beautiful or maybe hopeful or maybe that were future oriented in a way that writing about genocide can never be. Um, and 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 this material about the genocide kind of appeared like Freudian slips in the text, uh, things that kind of betrayed my, my, my real obsessions uh, in contrast to my, my stated intention or my stated plan. Um, and it, I mean, in that sense, I mean, this is also, I guess, in a way, a point about memory because, um, uh, because it was involuntary that, that these two subjects were brought together. I could not think about I could not write about uh, about love or infatuation without 
uh, in different ways, these memories of violence um, surfacing, kind of um, interrupting, interrupting the text as if to mock, as if to mock uh, the subject of the love affair, um, as as if to like, as if to interrupt it. I don't know if that's a that's an answer to your question, but a lot of this book was yes, the the kind of being forced as a writer to take seriously. Uh, this kind of involuntary, this kind of involuntary memory that I was that I was trying to forget or get away from. Yeah, I, I yeah. want to ask. Yeah, if I can uh, just add something. Yeah, uh, yeah, because uh, I, I was very interested in what uh, uh, interested in your question and what Miriam and uh, uh, Anouk said, uh, um, because there's a, I think there's also kind of a very interesting. Um, border between memory and nostalgia. Uh, no, so uh, basically, uh, my novel is set for a big part uh, in Bucharest, uh, and uh, where I was talking about the communist bloc, uh, and this can be said about the communist bloc or fascism in Italy. Uh, the idea that uh, when when the, the main character goes to Romania, he meets uh, all these people. I lived in Romania for a while. He meets all these people that are uh, uh, they exactly don't know what to think about their past, meaning they are living in the a new era, a new era, a capitalistic era with a new time, and they don't know what to think about Ceausescu, the dictatorship at the time they lived. And in a way, they are in between thinking that they are ashamed of what they lived, and at the same time that they are proud of what they were part of. Uh, and it's the a kind of thing uh, that we experience also in Italy, meaning that the people sometimes need a memory. So uh, Romanians after the 1989 and then when uh, uh, the so-called uh, uh, capitalism and globalism got there, they, they were told, oh, your past is nothing. You have to forget. It was uh, everything was wrong. You just you have just to get into this new narrative, this new world. And sometimes people are nostalgic, as there are lots of people that are uh, nostalgic of fascism in Italy because uh, they are left outside. They are, uh, they are nowhere. They need a narrative. And sometimes the only narrative they have since they, they lost their job, maybe with the, with the capitalism, they didn't have their job. They, were, they became poor. They're, they lost basically everything but still living uh, in the new era. And, they, and the only thing they can do is to try to get into a narrative uh, that is nostalgic. And that's why in Italy it's so hard and fascism is still there. And it's so hard, for instance, to um, the discussion about monuments and so on is going so, um, it's so strong. So meaning time, memory, and nostalgia is also building uh, a, a narrative you want to be in, uh, either from a personal point of view or from a collective point of view. Thanks. L let me ask one more question, then we, we can do readings if, if you have a short reading, and hopefully we'll have time uh, for a question. But um, one other question I wanted to ask is about the idea of journeys or some form of movement or travel in, in each of your books and how these distances affect perspectives. Um, Andrea, in yours, as you've said, uh, the character moves from, goes from Italy to Romania. And um, in uh, and Anouk, in yours, of course, there's a train journey that's at the center of the book to the north of, of Sri Lanka. And uh, Miriam in Haiti, in, in your book, um, it's seen, the earthquake is seen from both within and from without characters or, or outside. So tell me about how, uh, uh, travel or, or, or this motion affects the perspective, uh, how you wanted to use it in your books? Well, I, I can be brief and say, uh, maybe a, a slightly in response to what was said earlier, but I think in my case, I, as a Haitian slash Canadian slash American, I, who is also working in their second or third language, writing in English, um, I really have to be concerned with how the work is received by Canadian and American audiences. 
uh, because the relationship to Haiti is a neocolonial one. And so part of what I did with the characters is to really think about where those individuals were vis-a-vis -vis Haiti. So there's travel within Haiti, you know, from the countryside right. to Port-au-Prince. There's also those who have had to leave Haiti for economic reasons or for work, who, like the character you mentioned, who's in Rwanda, there is a, a musician who is in Boston, uh, and you have a very wealthy, you know, expat who is a, a water dealer who's in Paris, who's in France. Um, and those relationships are very, you know, uh, consistent with how Haitians are spread out all over the world because of colonial and neo-colonial relationships um, that Haiti are, is still subject to. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you. Yeah. Um, for me, I guess I'd say it's interesting. Uh, it kind of uh, uh, recalls what Andrea was saying, but um, the north of Sri Lanka uh, was a place that was um, under was was in a situation of war for thirty years, and um, and therefore more or less effectively cut off from the world for that period of time, which is not the case with with the south of the country where I grew up. And the journey, um, and it's funny because at the end of the war in 2010, 2011, if you, if you traveled to the Northeast, you'd see still young men wearing bell bottoms <laughs> from, you know, from the fashions of the 70s were still uh, kind of in style in a way. And they also didn't have access to, to films and to things like that from, from the outside world. And, and there is this kind of, the movement from South to North uh, on the train is, is is very much a, a kind of movement from one kind of time to another not just uh, one kind of historical time to another kind of historical time but also uh, to a place in which um, uh, things move uh, more slowly in which uh, the, the the passage of time is kind of um, I mean it's also from from the urban to the rural um, from that is to say from a place where uh, where the relativity of time, uh, uh, how we understand time in relationship to other people's movements, uh, uh, shifts to kind of an understanding of the passage of time in relationship to uh, the movement of the sun across the sky and the moon across the night and uh, the stars uh, across the horizon, in which uh, in which in which the relation to time is uh, the, in which time is a kind of relation to the natural world in a kind of in a kind of in a kind of different way, and and, and so the train journey for me, uh, in in these multiple senses, also consists of this movement from 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 one kind of time to another. And Anouk, it's also a very internal journey for him, isn't it? There's a passage yeah. I was looking for where he talks about he was traveling to the north of his mind, or something along those lines. Yeah, because the north is a subject of of the main character's memory like me the main character was cut off from his from his uh, from his ancestral village from his from his parents homes uh, and this was something that he he only he only gets to see in his in his 20s um, so he he moves into a space in a way into a space of his memory as he as he walks across that land it's as if he's walking across um, some region in the outskirts of his of his mind. So yeah, so it is also kind of yeah, it's it's this psychological movement as well. And Andrea, what's interesting is your your character Lorenzo goes to Romania, and he's also, I mean, there's a whole bunch of people, pioneers, entrepreneurs who are going to Romania to make money, but he's also seeing the Romanians come coming the other way, people yeah, coming. The, yeah. yeah, that's uh, yeah, it's um, it's a whole a. Uh, a whole journey that is at the same time a political one, meaning uh, uh, just people trying to um, to make money going towards east, uh, and people trying to survive or to, to make a living going to the west. So from Romania to uh, to Italy or or to Europe in general, um, and uh, and at the same time it's an internal journey as well. It's uh, uh, what he tries to do is to try to move his memory as if uh, uh, memories were stuck, they were just stuck there and he needed to move them just uh, going through them so that they could change their position and the past can 
be free. Well, the the one he was can can be free from the the uh, the idea that he had of himself. But at the same time, one thing that is uh, is very interesting is that uh, in a way he goes to a place where time is moving, is real, is alive. Uh, he comes from a place from Europe, uh, now is kind of stuck there uh, with a huge memory that uh, maybe is really a burden, a very big burden, and goes to a place where there was a system that just collapsed. Uh, and uh, so there are, the situation is uh, in a way much more in danger. There are much more people in danger and it's much more precarious, but at the same time, there is something that is hope for the future in memory or nostalgia of the past. So he goes there and he finally can experience that time exists and that we are not just stuck there because it's eternal. It's not eternal. We are just moving even if we think that things are not going to move at all. Thank you. So let's go into readings now and give give the readers a, a sense of these books. Miriam, do you want to start um, with a passage sure. and let us know, yeah, who's speaking and 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 sure. what? Sure. I'm going to try for something short here. It, this is in the voice of Olivier, who's an accountant, uh, and he has lived through the earthquake, lost his children in the earthquake, and has left his wife behind with one child to go on to another camp. And so he's uh, talking about this. He's talking about the moment a few months after the earthquake. Imagine if every single Haitian who lost someone could get their hands on some of that money, decide what they needed for themselves, their family. You could create a healthy working middle class and still there would be millions amassing in a treasure trove behind them. But of course they won't allow that to happen. They tell us first that we need to learn our lesson, death by hunger isn't enough, then that we need to build better infrastructure, then that we need to unlearn our corrupt ways, stop killing each other, have fewer dreams for our children, because everyone knows that we are a dreamless people, be good factory workers so that those who are already millionaires can become billionaires, and billionaires can become zillionaires, in short, aspire down, not up. A people who know what to do with nothing will know what to do with plenty, is my thinking. You can be sure of that. I only have to look at all the Madame Sarah at the sides of the roads and in the markets. I know they have a stash somewhere. After they pack up at the end of the day, the vast majority of them have a little cabane to go home to. They lay their heads down. They might even make enough to pay another woman a little something to clean while they're away, send the children to school, and greet the children when they return, have a pot of bone soup waiting on the stove. You're muted, Anderson. Um, should I go ahead and read, uh, maybe? Uh, so I'm just going to read from the, from the first paragraph of my novel, so no context required. The present, we assume, is eternally before us, one of the few things in life from which we cannot be parted. It overwhelms us in the painful first moments of entry into the world, when it is still too new to be managed or negotiated, remains by, a child, remains by our side during childhood and adolescence, in those years before the weight of memory and expectation, and so it is sad and little unsettling to see that we become, as we grow older, much less capable of touching, grazing, or even glimpsing it, that the closest we seem to get to the present are those brief moments we stop to consider the spaces our bodies are occupying, the intimate warmth of the sheets in which we wake, the scratched surface of the window on a train taking us somewhere else, as if the only way we can hold time still is by trying physically to prevent the objects around us from moving. The present, we realize, eludes us more and more as the years go by, showing itself for fleeting moments before losing us in the world's incessant movement, fleeing the second we look away and leaving scarcely a trace of its passing. Or this, at least, is how it usually seems in retrospect, when in the ne next brief moment of consciousness, the next occasion we are able to hold things still, we realize how much time has passed since we were last aware of ourselves, when we realize how many days, weeks, and months have slipped by without our consent. 
Events take place, moods ebb and flow, people and situations come and go. But looking back during these rare junctures in which we are, for whatever reason, lifted up from the circular daydream of everyday life, we are slightly surprised to find ourselves in the places we are, as though we were absent while everything was happening, as though we were somewhere else during the time that is usually referred to as our life. Waking up each morning, we follow by circuitous routes, the thread of habit, out of our homes, into the world, and back to our beds at night. Move unseeingly through familiar paths, one day giving way to another and one week to the next. So that when in the midst of this daydream, something happens and the thread is finally cut, when in a moment of strong desire or unexpected loss, the rhythms of life are interrupted, we look around and are quietly surprised to see that the world is vaster than we thought. As if we'd been tricked or cheated out of all that time, Time that in retrospect appears to have contained nothing of substance, no change and no duration. Time that has come and gone, but left us somehow untouched. Thank you, Anouk. And that, that really does give a sense of, of your passages, of the dense and long, long passages that are really beautiful. Thank you. And Andre, I think we only have time for you to finish with your reading. Yeah, I will. And uh, I have just uh, the only thing that has to be said that is that uh, uh, it's kind of a letter to a mother. So the you is the mother and the I uh, that is written or is talking to, uh, to her is the son. There's a time in the morning, a single moment when all the, when all the city lights go off at once. Like someone getting up in a single room, walking over to a switch, turning it off, then sitting back down. You never know when it's going to happen, you tell me. You have to stand by the window and watch. You can't get distracted, can't think. Thoughts are like somebody's hands, somebody coming up behind you, hands covering your eyes so you can't see. We did it together one time. I was up early to go to the bathroom and I found you in the kitchen because you couldn't sleep. You'd watch TV with the volume off at night. You sat on a stool staring at the images going by, sometimes falling asleep with your head on your arms. And I'd find you like that in the morning, like you were crying. I came into the kitchen because I saw the light and you were barefoot in your bathrobe laughing. You were so absorbed in your movie, you didn't ask me what I was doing there in the kitchen in the middle of the night. Still focused on the television, you gestured to the other stool and I sat down beside you. When the movie was over, you turned to me and said, what are you doing up? Then you got to your feet, turned off the set and whispered, let's go up to the attic, but tomorrow not a word of this to that. We put on our shoes and went up to see the lights go off from the dormer window. We were up there a while, the night before us, sitting under a single blanket on the ledge of the square window. We watched the lights trembling like embers, like a wind shivering over the coals. Then it was finally down and you said, pay attention now, don't blink. So I tried to keep my eyes as wide as I could, like when you have to have your picture taken and you don't want it to come out with your eyes closed. This went on a, a long time. They couldn't agree when to turn off the lights. I kept my eyes as wide open as I could, using all the muscles of my face and you kept saying, don't blink and everything kept staying exactly the same. Then finally it happened and I missed it. You said, so what did you think? And I said, I didn't see it. You were quiet a moment then said, well, I saw it for you. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you the three of you. And Miriam, Anouk, Andrea, and congratulations on your books. And Miriam, congratulations this week. Have a wonderful launch. Thank you. Good luck. And it's been a real pleasure. I wish we could speak more and talk more, and I wish we could meet in person. But um, but thank you for this evening. Thank you, Andy. Thank this you, everybody. Thank Good you, to Andy. meet everybody. Nice thank to you meet for you everyone both. to coming. 
Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone, and thank Bye. you again.